All right, everyone, uh, we are live. Uh, I, I'm excited about today's talk and today's guest. I, I could easily be watching the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the uh, Green Bay Packers, but I, I think, uh, yeah, my guest today, I think we're going to have a lot of fun today. So I'm going to share this over on my original Big Discussions 76 channel. That is my... <laughs> That's my main antenna. Uh, so, if, you know, if folks want to come over here, they can come over here. Uh, let me make sure that I'm broadcasting to YouTube. I got one like before the stream started. That's always good to get a like before the stream starts. That means someone is interested in it and they're eager to learn something. Okay, so we are live. Okay, so I'm gonna share this over on my original channel and then we'll jump in because I want to respect my guest's time and uh, yeah, I, I, wanna, I wanna learn something from him uh, myself, some things. Okay, let's see. All right, that's been shared over there. So I'm going to go back to my STEM channel. I'm gonna play the intro and then we will get started. All right, hey, uh, CR Frank, thank you for, um, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing my cash up on PayPal. Everyone, if you want to, whoever's watching, if you're watching live or on the playback, if you want to make a donation to the channel, uh, CR Frank just shared my uh, cash app uh, and uh, my PayPal is here. I don't have a super chat over here or AdSense. So if you want to make a donation, that information is here. Okay. I'm going to play the intro. <laughs> Snuggles, thank you for uh, stopping through as well. I think those are balloons. I think those are balloons. Um, so I'm going to play the intro. And then I'm going to start and then I'm going to bring my guest up and uh, we're going to learn something about uh, health physics and um, what's all entailed in that field and how my guest got into that career. So I'll see you soon.
All right, everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is uh, Dr. Anwar Youssef Dunbar, and this is Big Discussions 76, Science and Technology. First of all, please like this stream. Uh, please share and please consider subscribing if this is your uh, first time here. And that all goes for if you're watching on the playback as well. Well, everyone, uh, I have another guest uh, today. Um, a, little, a little while ago, I was thinking that this channel would be more exciting if I had interesting and exciting guests. I have one today, uh, and he's going to talk to us about uh, health physics. Um, and yeah, so 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 this is someone I've, I've known for a little while. We were actually colleagues before. Uh, we won't disclose where we were colleagues or I think that, you know, that there, there are some limits on what he could say about what he's doing now, but we, we know each other and that, that, that's how I, I, I know this individual. And I, and I know that, um, he may, he's going to talk to us about this. He made a, uh, a, a bit of a career change and he changed his focus and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, once again, I don't have a super chat over here or I don't have AdSense. So if you want to make a donation, you can donate to my cash app or PayPal. The newsletter is back up. The, the subscription form to the newsletter is back up. It was down. Uh, I'm gonna talk about that at the end. Um, before I bring my guest, uh, Connor Williams up, I'm gonna just lay out some pieces for, um, in case people are, are unfamiliar with this sandbox that we're gonna be talking about today. And um, if I leave something out or if I misspeak, uh, Connor can correct me and say, you know, there's also, uh, this is also an important aspect. This is an important aspect as well. Uh, Ken Sean, <laughs> I guess the Buffalo Bills lost. Ken Sean says, great game, Dr. Don Barhart fought. Yeah, I think the Bills just lost. They were down by four points. Um, okay, so I'm gonna lay out some pieces and then I'm gonna bring Connor up. I wanna respect everybody's time here. Toya the Texan is also uh, here. Thank you for stopping through, uh, Toya. Always a pleasure to see you. Okay, so physics. Physics is considered the grandfather of all the sciences. For those of you not in the sciences, um, that's just kind of the general understanding. So you have physics, chemistry, biology, and you have all these other, well, some would, con some would also consider mathematics to be a, a science, uh, the master teacher uh, called it a philosophy, but you have all these other aspects that expand out from physics. My background is in pharmacology uh, and to some extent toxicology. And uh, I, I can recall when doing my experiments at the University of Michigan, um, a good amount of the equipment that we used in the lab, even though we were conducting biological experiments, those instruments ran off of uh, physics principles. So I'm gonna jump in today with the electromagnetic uh, spectrum, which is this, which is depicted in, in this picture here. Um, I was thinking about, when, you, when I was thinking about, um, uh, I, okay, I, we're, we're talking about health physics, and uh, radiation protection. When I was thinking about radiation, I was thinking about um, ionizing particles. And that led me back to the electromagnetic spectrum. So we all live on the planet Earth. I'm gonna center this on the planet Earth first. Uh, and the Earth's atmosphere, one of, one of the things we know is that it filters out, um, and Connor can correct me on this when he comes up, the, the, the atmosphere filters out ionizing rays from the sun. And I, I was also thinking that uh, in my discussions about um, 5G, most of you know that there's a, a large community of people who are distrustful of, of 5G uh, prior to the pandemic. Uh, 5G was being implicated in what was happening with the bug. Um, and so if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, in the case of 5G, from what I read, uh, it is somewhere in between uh, infrared and, and, and the radio wave range, which um, deals with, uh, um, it's going to 
cause an increase in heat. But the further you go towards um, ultraviolet X-rays and gamma rays, once you get into that range, now you're looking at uh, ionizable. You're, you're in the ionizable range. So you can see the change in the nanometers there. Um, and what does that mean for living things? What does that mean for carbon-based uh, organisms like us and our dogs and our cats and reptiles and amphibians and even aquatic life? Well, living things in our, now we're going back to biology 101, uh, our cells contain uh, DNA and RNA. So our cells contain nucleic acids. Uh, the backbones for those nucleic acids are um, joined by covalent bonds. Now we're jumping into a little bit of chemistry. Um, and a covalent bond is a stable bond with sharing the sharing of electrons. But if you have something ionizing coming in, you're going to have um, reactive uh, species. That might not be the right, the right word for this, but you're going to have something coming in with the potential to damage that DNA and disrupt the bonds that are holding it together. I suspect the same would be true for uh, RNA. Uh, but when you're talking about nuclear and, you, and when you start playing around in that sandbox, you're, now you're thinking about creating um, particles, uh, um, particles that can ionize covalent bonds. Um, okay, I'm not in my sandbox here, so I'm just trying to give a general picture. So once you get damage to those nucleic acids, well, downstream from those, we know that those nucleic acids lead to the production of proteins. So if you damage those nucleic acids in theory, you can get damaged proteins or proteins that have a certain on and off switch. And we know that certain proteins in our cells, depending upon the tissue and the organ, they have an on and off switch. Well, once you get damaged proteins, those may not work the way that they're supposed to. And they may do things like lead to uh, increased cell division, which can lead to uh, tumor genesis. So I'm going to show one more picture here just to kind of Again, lay out the pieces and kind of give some context for what we're going to talk about. This is this is biology 101. You have um, an amino acid right there over on the right. The higher up you go, the more complex you get. You get an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet, a polypeptide chain, and then a, uh, a complex protein molecule. Well, if you have DNA damage, if you have damage to the nucleic acid that's giving rise to that particular protein, you can get an abnormal protein and then a cancerous state, a sick individual, and eventually death. So those are kind of the pieces that when you think about, and Connor can correct me if I'm wrong when he comes up, but when you're talking about um, um, health physics and radiation protection, I think these are the things that this is the general sandbox that we're going to be playing in today. So everyone with that, I'm going to welcome up my guest, uh, Mr. Uh, Connor Williams. Connor, welcome. Oh, didn't see you there. Excuse me. Nice to have you with us. All right. How's it going? Not bad. I couldn't resist that intro. Uh, yeah, I like the, the, the tobacco pipe. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you, you, you got to go all the way if you go. That's what I say. I need like the white lab coat though, and then the pocket protector, like true 50 style. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna do it. Uh, no, in terms of your intro, uh, a lot of it was correct. Um, so yeah, radiobiology is the specific part of our field that deals with how incoming radiation or incident radiation causes cell damage and then causes disease, which there's really, oh, I forget this is, my controls are inverted here. There's two different types. There's stochastic and non-stochastic. Stochastic being cancer, because it, it's based on the uh, the likelihood, the statistical likelihood of it happening. And the non-stochastic being everything else, where it's a matter of the more uh, exposure to radiation that you have, the more disease you will have. Whereas there's <coughs> the threshold, uh, there is no threshold considered now in terms of developing cancer per exposure. So you're, you're familiar with that concept too. 
what we used to do in toxicology where the, the, the threshold standard. Uh, okay. They're evaluating that now, actually, because uh, it turns out that not having a threshold was actually a decision that was made in the, the late 60s, early 70s, and that may not have been made on the best data. So maybe, maybe if we're very lucky, they may actually redo that that standard for cancer and not have a threshold there. And that would be really important. Okay, so are you saying a uh, threshold has been, that concept has been pulled back for the chemical context or is, is, it, is it just not valid in the, the radiation? So context? when I'm speaking of it specifically, I'm specifically talking about the radiation side of things because uh, a lot of the, the no threshold limit uh, was based on experiments that were done with fruit flies with drosophilia and uh, radiation. And it turns out that a lot of that data was either misconstrued or just not reported correctly, and a lot of it didn't really apply. So the, there is an organization called the Health Physics Society, HPS. Uh, they're sort of the overarching professional organization for people in my profession, much like the Society of Toxicologists is for toxicology. And they have a great, like a 20-part video series going through the entire history of the no threshold for cancer and how it came about and how it may not actually be as correct as we once thought it might be. So it's, it's something we're checking out. Okay. Let me see if I can, I'll find it. I'll see if I can find a link to that after this and I'll send it over to you so you can get to your viewers. Okay. That'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah. So the other thing is uh, snuggles. I saw like 20 and change red balloons, but you got to put 99 up there if you really want to go for the meme. And uh, there we go. I, I need 99 of those though. And do it in German. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm unfamiliar with, with what's happening here. I'm talking to your audience right now. Well, no, no, no. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. Snuggle said, "Drop the link." I'm not sure. No, he's got red balloons. I'm saying he needs 99 red balloons if he wants to go for the meme. You never heard the song? I'm I'm not familiar with that. Connor, I'm sorry. I'm I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm out of the loop here. You're a child of the Cold War. You should know. Okay. <laughs> um. So uh, actually the one other thing was in the atmosphere, the atmosphere protects us from a lot of the, the instant ionizing radiation that comes both from the sun and from the rest of space. Yes. Cosmic rays. But what you can get <clears throat> is you get uh, cosmogenesis, which is uh, nuclide species, so isotopes that are radioactive that don't naturally exist on earth, like carbon-14, some mm -hmm. nitrogen and oxygen species. And those are created by impacts in the atmosphere from cosmic rays, several other sources. And so then they fall to earth and that's how carbon dating works because a certain amount of the carbon on the surface of this earth is radioactive and decays at a known rate. And so for things like plants and animals, things that intake carbon, uh, you almost everything on earth has a baseline of, of the amount of carbon 14 that should be in it. And so if you find something that was dead, bones that were dead long time ago, you know, fossils, if they were carbon containing, uh, pieces of wood and structures and things like that, then you can look at the amount of carbon-14 that remains in them now. And because you know more or less how much you should have versus how much you have now, you can see how much decayed, and that will tell you exactly how many years it took to decay to that point. So that's how carbon dating works. Um, it doesn't really work as effectively after May 1945, once we exploded Trinity, because it really messed up the overall ratio of... of radioactive materials that we have in Earth's atmosphere. So it doesn't really work for anything kind of after that point as effectively or efficiently as it would beforehand. Um, but it's still definitely a useful tool, useful in so many different aspects from archaeology to sociology, to anthropology, base history. And then another fun aspect of that actually is because of our use of fossil fuels, especially cars, planes, ships, things that belt a lot of carbon into the atmosphere, the carbon that we use to do that has been in the ground so long as oil that almost all of the carbon-14 is gone. It's all decayed away for the most part. And so the, the carbon that we're putting into the atmosphere lowers the overall ratio of carbon-14 that should be there. So there are studies all the time that find if you date plants and sometimes animals that are found right next to where a highway is, and then you date plants further away from that highway, the plants that are right next to the highway will actually appear to be thousands of years older than the plants that are just a little further away from the highway because the relative ratio of carbon-14 is lower since it, they've been intaking all the carbon-14 free carbon that you've been putting out in the atmosphere in cars. Oh, interesting. 
Okay. Okay. I, I'll probably have to uh, replay this, and listen to that, and it, so so it all kinds of sure. Kind of clicks. Or another one for all you alcohol lovers out there is wine. You can tell the difference between a very good and a cheaper wine by measuring the amount of carbon fourteen that's in it, because real wine grown from real fields and real grapes actually intakes the proper amount of carbon-14 from the atmosphere during the growth process, and then that makes it into the eventual wine. Whereas cheap wine basically just cuts off the growth process early so they can make more wine faster. It doesn't allow nearly as much of a growth of the grape or enough maturity of the grape to make a good wine. And the way that they up the alcohol content is that they use industrial alcohol, just put industrial alcohol into the wine to make the alcohol content the way it should be. Industrial alcohol is made originally from oil, which has no carbon-14 in it. So the amount of carbon-14 that's in bad wine that's been uh, basically had the industrial alcohol put into it is much lower than real wine that's actually made properly. Okay. All right, everyone. Well, there are some nice uh, uh, factoids. And um, yeah, those, 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 there, those some extras there. I didn't intend to ask what Connor gave us. I don't know. Sometimes I find the factoids and the fun bits are what make the job fun when you can actually point your finger at something and be like, I know why that is. That's, that's kind of the beauty of science, really, at the end of the day, when something can happen and you can look at it and be like, I know why that is. I know exactly why that happened. Okay. Or sometimes you have no idea, and then it's on you to go find it out, and that makes it even more exciting. Okay. All right. Well, well Connor, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, again, I want to I be respectful of your time, so I, I sent you some questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, what's funny is I was thinking that, uh, you know, as a YouTube content creator, uh, science is a, is a, uh, a tricky topic because it falls under education versus entertainment. And so certain people will be interested in this, but I also realized that we're, we're restricted. Um, I mean, if you're talking about biology 101, if you're talking about the periodic table, no one really cares in terms of that being proprietary or being dangerous information, but we're regulated here on YouTube uh, in terms of what we can say, but also in terms of where we work, we're regulated, uh, especially if you're dealing with proprietary information. Um, I don't talk about in depth what I do for my nine to five because I can't. Uh, And also there was a bit of a, um, uh, you had to get some clearance before coming here to talk with me Yep. So, so you just so I, I want to thank your 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 uh, your colleagues for allowing this, but also I just that's just something I thought about in terms of when you're talking about science. There are some things that you can't openly discuss uh, depending upon where you are. So, anyway, right. so so thank you for uh, agreeing to this interview. Um, Absolutely. Connor and I used to work together. Um, Places that shall remain nameless. Yeah, we can't we can't talk about where that is right now. Um, if I leave, I'll, I'll talk all all about it, but I can't talk about it right now. Um, so, kind of, you're in. We'll, we'll start with with this. So you're in health physics, uh, and I think radiation protection. Um, and I remember we worked together, and then you you pivoted to that. But talk about your education up to that point. Was your education mostly in the biological sciences, or was it in something else? Sure. So I originally went to uh, Johns Hopkins University for my undergrad, and I majored, I ended up majoring in public health. I had started out majoring in, I think it was actually Chinese studies, or it was East, no, it was East Asian studies, because I had just gotten back from an extended trip to China right before I went, and I wasn't sure whether I wanted, you know, where I wanted to go. It was undergrad. You, You don't know what you want. You just pick a path and follow it and see what happens. And so I ended up getting a my major in public health, not from any, you know, super passionate attachment to public health. I was just good at it. I understood the concepts. I got good grades. I liked my professors. You know, that's reason enough to keep going for something. So I did that. And then there was a program that Hopkins had where it was, you add an extra fifth year, which was done in quarters. And then it was, if you do enough um, credit hours in that extra year, then you can get a masters as well as an add-on to your original bachelor's. So I ended up getting a, uh, a master's in human toxicology and pathophysiology, and that was from the Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins. 
Uh, and that, so that was in 2013. <clears throat> and then I went out into the wide world in 2013, for those of you old enough to remember, was the year when we had a great big government shutdown, um, which I had had several jobs lined up and then all of those got absolutely wiped away because all the contracts that they were based on got destroyed. All the money that, you know, that they used to fund those, those positions was all gone. So I ended up working actually as a cashier at Barnes and Noble for a good while. <laughs> Just to make ends meet. And, you know, we've all, we've all been there. We've all gone through that sort of thing. And so eventually I got into a, uh, a fellowship program that had been recommended to me by an old professor of mine. And that is what led me to EPA. Am I allowed to talk about my experience at EPA? I would keep it general. Cool. Uh, but, yeah, but I think I think we – okay, so I'll just – I'm, sorry. I'm, that, that, I'm not sure where we you can and can't talk about stuff. Well, I'll just, I'll just I think it's it's safe to say that that you can you can just name the agency, um, but we, we we got involved in human health and regulatory, um, cool. involving a certain chemical class. I th I think that's you I want to keep it that general. Okay, so let's start off in the office of water. I'll just make it that general, working on water things, and eventually made my way over to working with certain classes of chemicals. And uh, that's where Anwar and I worked together. So we, we were both, and we'll stay away from that subject, but we were both toxicologists. So our main focus was looking at, in science generally, was looking at how toxicants, which is things external to the body, come into the body and then end up causing disease, either on a macro or on a cellular level. And then we look at scientific data and we do stuff. So it's funny. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I did. And I did that for three years. Um, and eventually a couple things happened. One is that the field of toxicology is not as broad as I had hoped. I'm allowed to opine about this stuff, right? Like, okay, cool. So uh, I had gone into the field of toxicology mostly because again, I had this fellowship program and that's what led me to, to working in EPA in various capacities. And I hadn't put a whole lot of thought into the future or what I wanted the future to be or to look like or you know, what my dreams and goals were. It was a job. I needed a job. It was a job. Um, but, you know, I spent enough time there. I got enough to get on my feet and running after spending so much time in undergrad and having no money. Um, so I was able to look around a little bit. And the field of toxicology is, is actually really kind of narrow because either you work in a regulatory capacity for either a state or a federal government or something of that capacity, or you work in academia. And really that's kind of it. There's not a whole lot of private industry for it. There's not a whole lot of room for it. And the job market, at least when I was looking around was pretty tight. There wasn't a whole lot of opportunity. And so I was looking for something kind of different to do. I just, I didn't want to say burned out. I only been there for three years, but like, Washington, D.C. and living there was nice and I liked the people, but living in D.C. didn't really do it for me. I'm originally from Colorado and I wanted to see some mountains and some landscape and some blue sky again instead of just gray all the time. So I was looking around for ways to maybe go back to Colorado where a lot of my family's from and, you know, find something to do. And I came across uh, a program at CSU, Colorado State University, for health physics. And I knew what health physics was only because I had seen just in my free time, I had seen a, a video come up on YouTube and it was an old 50 style video about uh, a nuclear accident that had happened in this country called SL one or stationary low power reactor one. And it was a nuclear accident that ended up killing three people in 1961. And so it was this big, you know, government funded video, basically the government put together for itself in the early sixties to explain what happened and how the accident occurred and the physics behind it. And I, I love watching those things for, you know, there's a lot of people that are out there that love true crime or love watching murder mysteries. And I love watching disaster epics or, you know, like uh, Mayday, the show about air crashes or things like that, how engineering goes wrong, how things go bad and the chain of mistakes it takes to make something happen. I love all of that. So I had seen this video and they discussed health physics, which was heavily involved in that. So I knew what the program at CSU was. 
had an idea what health physics was. And because I had seen this video, this one video from 1961, in my head, I was like, oh, that's super cool and exciting. It's way more awesome than sitting in a cubicle all day in Washington, D.C. getting rain on. Let's do that. <laughs> and luckily enough, I went and did that. And uh, it's worked out really well. Okay, Connor, let's take a quick pause because you said a lot. You said a lot. Let's let's unpack some of that. Sure. So for everyone, um, I left in the chat there. I, I most of you know, if you don't know, I'm also a writer. So I, I wrote a blog post a couple of years ago, and some of these are coming in handy right now. If you want to know what regulatory science is, because we were working in regulatory science, so um, this essay <laughs> is there. Uh, we were on the uh, the public sector side. Uh, if you want to know what toxicology is, uh, that post is also there. I wrote these up to be very, very understandable by the lay person. Nice. Okay. Nice. Uh, and nice. Connor, Connor um, talked about something. I'm going I'm to pull the video up that he talked about, <laughs> but it's worth us it's worth us talking about here. You, you talked about something I think that I think most people go through at some point, you know, you train up um, in, a, in a certain area or you get a job in a certain area and then you start to wonder, okay, is this job for me? Um, toxicology. It's funny that you, it's, well, it's interesting that, that you, you said that the opportunities were, um, there were limits on the opportunities. I had another coworker from years ago who, uh, I don't know if this was, was for his own personal affirmation, but he'd go on and on and on about the opportunities available in toxicology. But what I'm learning is that you're, as you said, you're gonna land in certain places. You're gonna land in academia. You're gonna land in the federal government, working in the cube, going to meetings, writing reports, battling for promotions chairing committees, or you're going to end up in the private sector somewhere um, at a pharmaceutical company, at a chemical company. Yeah. Or, or maybe maybe at some point, maybe you might start your own consulting group. So so that's going to land you in certain, certain places. But some people, in terms of working in a cubicle, in a government capacity, that, that gets a little stale after a while. <laughs> it did for me, certainly. And you're right. I mean, there, there is um, actually a good amount of private industry for toxicology if you've got the PhD. As I found out when I was looking, because I just had the master's at that point, which was enough to get me a job in regulatory science, but not really enough to do research science or anything like that. And that's where a lot of the, the bigger opportunities comes from. That's where a lot of the, the money comes from is really on that side of things. So I was staring down the barrel of either having to go back and get a whole nother PhD just to come back to the same field I was already in to get better opportunities for myself or switching it up and finding something new. I, I chose the latter. Okay. I'm going to read, uh, I want to get CR Frank in here because he was one of the first ones in. He says, um, I work in radiation protection as well. I'm a few tests away from being fully qualified. Maybe you could talk to us about what that means, Connor. Yeah. Then, um, CR. Then, uh, hold on. Uh, and then last Zulu says, uh, toxicology is a study of toxins in the human body. Correct. And how they affect the body, but not just toxins, other things as well. Toxicant. Toxicant, Toxicant. is the word. Yeah. Okay. So Connor, um, I'm going to show, I'm not going to show the video. I'm going to show the link. I'm going to screen share it in case anyone, I'll take a look at this afterwards. I don't want to get a copyright strike. Yeah. Um, we got a copyright yeah. strike. One, it's, it's a, it was made by the federal government. So by definition, it's open source. Um, and two, it was made by a government entity that doesn't exist anymore. Okay. So Connor, do you want to just give us the brief sales pitch? Yeah. On this video? Yeah, sure. And I mean, this is just, I'll, I'll give the huge 30,000 foot view because we want to be fast on this. So, January 3rd, 1961, there was a reactor that was built here in Idaho uh, called SL-1, Stationary Low Power Reactor 1. And so it was originally built for the Army, and they wanted a small 
portable new type of nuclear reactor that could be built almost anywhere and that that could provide military bases around the world with electrical power and heat. And so they were testing this reactor design. And in the early morning hours of January 3rd, 1961, uh, there was an event and there was the gentleman, the three gentlemen that were working on it at that point were supposed to be performing a maintenance operation where they were manually connecting the machinery that controlled the control rods the control rods being the, the rods inside of a nuclear reactor that control how much reactivity occurs within a reactor at any given time by absorbing neutrons. And so they're supposed to connect the machinery that moves these control rods up and down to the control rod itself. And in order to do that, they had to lift one of the control rods and they were supposed to lift it, I believe it was four centimeters. And instead it ended up being lifted something like 24 centimeters out of the reactor. And that caused something called what we call a prompt critical where the reactor went critical all at once. It released an enormous burst of neutrons and a positive feedback cycle, and it caused the reactor to functionally blow up, which when I say blow up, it sounds overly dramatic. What happened is it immediately boiled all the water that was sitting in the reactor instantaneously, which created a giant void bubble of steam, and that caused the water that was sitting just above the actual rods to immediately get forced upwards and hit the top of the reactor pressure vessel, which made that thing jump nine feet in the air. This is a multi-hundred ton piece of metal and machinery. Jump nine feet in the air, shoot all of the, the rods out the top, and then settle back down. Not the actual rods didn't come out, but the, the machinery and the guide rods that controlled that actually shot out the top. So it ended up killing the, the three operators that night, uh, from mostly from blunt force trauma, but one of them was also certainly from radiation injuries. And uh, it caused a, a nuclear accident uh, that thankfully, because SL1 was way out in the desert, it didn't really affect anyone else in the immediate area. Um, but even today, there's actually a, a, a cleanup area or just a, a defined area around where SL1 was, which uh, is still has certain trace amounts of radioactivity on it. So this video right here explains the accident, explains what they were doing, how they were doing it, how they may or may not have made mistakes. And critically, this explains a lot of the cleanup operation because it was a, a two year effort that they had to do to clean this all up, to decon the building, to demolish it, to find out ways to get rid of the waste. And it's just the, the whole process of how America dealt with this problem in 1961. Okay, Connor, give me a second here. Connor, I think this is a nice teachable moment. Uh, if you could humor us for a few minutes, it sounds like you're familiar enough with these reactors and how they work. Do um, you feel like giving us the, a brief walkthrough? If I show this picture, do you feel up to giving us a brief walkthrough, just the basic, basic for the, for the layperson, how yeah. these things work? Hold yeah. on, let me, let, me, yeah. let, me, let me cue the picture up. Give me a second. And I just pulled this off of Google. Because... This, this is important because, as, as we said before the stream, as we talked about, there are a lot of horror stories, like the ones you just described. There's Chernobyl. There's all these different things. Uh, with, with, with a th Three Mile Island, where, where people just hear a nuclear reactor and they go, ah, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. So, here, here's a generic picture I just pulled off of uh, Google. You, you want to explain some of this? Perfect. Yes, absolutely. So... Uh, we'll start by basically saying that all power generation, with the exception of solar power and wind power, all, all real scale power generation is based upon boiling water and using the steam created from boiling water to turn a turbine. Yes. The turning magnet in the turbine makes electricity, which make, you know, light go. So nuclear power is uh, doing that. And basically what it does is you have rods that are made out of uranium, in some cases, plutonium. Okay. And those rods produce, how do I keep this on a simple level? Because I, I feel like nerding out so bad right now. All right, keep it for, for the lay person. For the lay, for the lay person. person. Those rods produce a subatomic particle, comes off of that uranium. It's a big atom, and that big atom makes a neutron go away from it. Because some of them are what are considered unstable. This is uranium-235 is unstable. So it has a neutron leave that atom. And that neutron, if it strikes another big atom of uranium, has a chance 
to actually split that uranium atom into multiple pieces, which releases more neutrons than you started with. So when you had one uranium, it made a neutron go away, struck another uranium, and now you can have two or sometimes three neutrons leave that reaction. And those have a chance to go on and hit other uranium atoms to cause them to split, or the word is fission. And then that can cause basically a reaction to occur where all these fissioning um, atoms are splitting apart. And when those atoms split apart, they release a certain amount of very, what we call quantized, a very specific amount of energy. And that energy is released as heat. So if this pile of uranium atoms is surrounded by water, that heat goes into the water, which makes it very, very hot, and eventually it will boil to create steam, which then we can use to go turn a turbine. Okay. Is that big enough for you? That was awesome. Yeah. So so I think I, I think this cartoon, if you're just coming in, if you hit that like button, uh yeah, that that definitely helps. If you're gonna click on the link for at least for you know a minute or whatever, please definitely hit that like button. So Connor, if I have this cartoon here, is this is this a representative of uh fission? Because we, we hear these words. Yes. Okay. Nuclear fission. So I mean this is nuclear fission. So you have an incident proton and it looks like it's leaving as a as an alpha particle helium so yeah i mean it's um i'm not exactly sure what this picture specifically is describing but uh yeah so it, it's a you can have an incident neutron which hits an atom which is a collection of protons and neutrons and then if it hits it in the right way at the right speed it will cause that atom to actually split into two pieces okay so, so in summary, and then we're going to move on. In summary, when this we're is what talking about splitting the atom, okay, when we're talking about nuclear power plants. Which yeah. all, all you're doing ultimately is heating water, so it'll turn a turbine. Right, that's um, the, all that you're doing is heating water to turn a turbine. And so the okay. way that we do that with nuclear power is like in this picture you have on the the left hand side, it has control rods. Yes. So you stick enough uranium next to each other that it will start this process where the fissions in uranium will cause more fissions, will cause more fissions, and it's a reaction that continues. And then what you do is you have control rods, and these are typically borated, meaning containing the, um, the element boron, which is very good at absorbing neutrons and then not letting them go. And you use the control rods to move up and down inside the reactor to control how many neutrons, the term for this is neutron flux, which is a measurement of how many neutrons in a given space are occurring inside of the pile. And so you use those control rods to, it's like hitting the accelerator on your car. If you raise them up, you get more reaction. If you hit the brake pedal, you get less reaction. Okay, so the control rods control the, the, the neutrons, uh, the outflow of the neutrons. Right. It controls the amount of neutrons in the core, which through that controls the amount of heat that's being generated in the core. OK. And so just briefly, we have uh, last Zulu just said something. When, when these things, when we have these accidents, is it usually something involving the control rods? No. So SO1 is a very interesting case where that was a mistake. Uh, there are some other theories, but we're going to go with a mistake that was made in a maintenance procedure. Okay. Every major uh, reaction, a reactor accident that we've ever had, whether it be Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, or most recently Fukushima back in 2011, has been caused by the same thing. And it's called an LOC or a loss of coolant accident, meaning that the amount of coolant flowing through the core water has stopped for some reason. Three Mile Island, there is a long chain of reasons why that happened. Thankfully, we learned from our mistakes and our experience, and that really, we have a very strict program in place now for all the, the reactors in this country to not let those, those that same type of mistake happen again. In Chernobyl, it was clearly operator error. For any of you who've seen the HBO miniseries, it actually handles the, the, the accident itself and the story of it very well and pretty much very accurately. And in Fukushima, it was uh, a massive tsunami, which knocked out the electrical power to the power plant and then also the diesel generators, which are the ones that kept the, the coolant flowing through the core. So when you don't have coolant flowing through the core while it's running, it will get too hot. And then once it gets too hot, bad things happen. Things start to break. Things start to melt. 
that's where you get accidents from. Okay. And everyone, I'm gonna, on my community tab, uh, I, didn't, I didn't expect me and Connor to get in this discussion about how reactors work. I mean, I think it was probably a natural uh, place for us to segue to based upon what he's working on in terms of his career. But I'll, I will share that on my community tab when we get done here in case people want to look at it and listen to what we talked about. So, um, so kind of before we go on, just briefly, I had someone on last week to talk about electric cars and, you know, that there's a push for electric cars. Yeah. So, so en energy is a big deal. So would you say that nuclear um, is a, we have to have some form of nuclear going forward? Would you, is, is that true? Or would you say that, well, what would you say? <laughs> I would say that there, there's no option. And I'm really glad to see that people are coming around to this because if you want to have a future where you divest from fossil fuels, and eventually you'll have to, there will be a point at which fossil fuels are very finite and you can't get anymore. So wind and solar power are good forms of power generation, but they're both temporal, meaning if there's no wind, you're stuck. If there's no sun, you're stuck. And so nuclear is the only option that exists that is a reliable baseline to generate power without generating any carbon, without generating any CO2 or any other gases into the atmosphere, without contributing to climate change at all. And so it, in going into the future, if we want to have a carbon-free future, if we want to have a future where we address climate change, it is literally, and I mean this sincerely, the only option that humanity has to actually deal with this problem at any kind of scale. Because you can put all the solar panels, all the windmills you want. You will never get enough power everywhere to actually have a baseline electric load that will actually feed the whole country or the world by extension. You have to have nuclear power as your base load supplemented by wind power and by solar power. That's the only way to do it. And okay. thankfully, a lot of people are starting to come around to that. A lot of people that traditionally, let's say on you know the more blue side of the, the American spectrum, uh, traditionally would have just dismissed nuclear outright. But thankfully with climate change, uh, even a lot of people on that side of coin are starting to really come around to the idea of using nuclear power again. Okay, yeah, so I wanted to ask that question because again, I just had someone on who to talk about clean energy and um, electric cars and al alternative energy uh, strategies. But I think mm -hmm. with, with I'm not, I don't want to make this a uh, political no. discussion. No, but, I, but, I think, but I think it's, and, I, I, and I, I, had, I just spoke with two economists, a, an economist and a political scientist over on my original channel. It's important for the public to know what's being talked about and what's being proposed when these things are being debated. Okay, um, and, and, and a lot of the public doesn't have uh, a firm understanding of what's really going on, so they don't understand what's being said, and they're easily manipulated, in my opinion. So that's why I think that was important for you to, you know, just share that with us. Yeah, so it's, yeah, if you want to have a baseline load capacity, and especially if people are going to be switching to electric cars, which going into the future, they absolutely should. That, that should be what we do as a species. You know, switch to electric cars, you want to really fully electrify things, you want to have, let's say, electric ships, there's been proposals for electric aircraft. If you want to have the future be carbon free, which we should, you have to have a base electrical load capacity for the country or for the world made by nuclear. And then everything else you can supplement with solar power and wind power. And if someone out there wants to talk to me, about fusion power, I will tell you it's 20 years away, just like it was 20 years away 20 years ago, and then 20 years before that. I believe I'm gonna see it. Okay. So okay. So Connor, I don't I don't I don't um where geez we're at 50 minutes. All right. Um you get last year, what he said was uh, he said uh screw that please nerd out think about it only five people in here only nerd will come here. Only nerds will come here. Okay all right all right so I guess you have a green light to nerd out. Uh, and he also says, uh, I actually, actually, I agree. If you have nuclear energy as your base and solar power, you should be able to run the country successfully off of those two forms of energy plus a dam. Plus a dam. Give a dam. Get nuclear. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So, Connor, so, so, you, so you talked about yeah. why you switched fields. 
talk about the curriculum you had to study in order to make the jump from where you were into where you are now. Did you have to, I mean, you're Johns Hopkins, the name speaks for itself. You already had physics, you already had chemistry. Yeah. What what types of specialized trainings did you need to make that jump? So um you know, I was actually surprised how much toxicology really helped because I definitely had to, to, to go and relearn some physics because I had taken physics, um, you know, in high school and in undergrad. It had never really been my main focus because my focus had either been public health kind of medicine, which was way more biology focused than it was physics and mathematics. So I took it, but I was never really my main subject. And for all of you out there, I my entire life have struggled with mathematics. I've hated it. And a lot of that was because I had one teacher in sixth grade that was an awful person and loved to just actually humiliate people in class in front of everybody about their math skills, whether they could or they couldn't, to just reinforce the fact that, oh, you can't do math. I don't know why he loved doing that. I'm gonna leave that alone. But the fact is that I always have struggled with math mathematics. And so it was actually pretty daunting when I went back to health physics because I had just, like I said, chosen it kind of on a whim because I saw something cool on YouTube once. And uh, I was actually kind of worried about that by the amount of mathematics that I'd have to go back and learn, by the amount of physics I'd have to go back and, and restudy. And it wasn't that bad. So there's, um, there's a, a graduate program in health physics from Colorado State University. That's one of the best programs in the country. It's taught by a man named Thomas Johnson, Dr. Thomas Johnson, who wrote, and I'm saying this literally, literally wrote the book on health physics. It's the book that we studied. It's the book that everyone else in the country studies. He wrote it. So he's a very knowledgeable person, and there's a lot of coursework with um, radiation physics. So the physics of how atoms give off energy, X-rays, alpha particles, beta particles, gamma rays certain other exotic weird things. Uh, well, I do, hold on, Connor, I do have a... Yeah, you have a, a graphic a cartoon here. Yeah, there we go. So this is this is a, a graphic dealing with the scales of things. So, uh, yeah, the nucleus is on the order of uh, atometers, uh, or, excuse me, picometers there. Um, then you have, yeah, the proton and the neutron, and then the electron hanging around the outside. Quarks are some atomic particles, which are what make up protons and neutrons. Um, we don't really deal with them. We, those are more on theoretical physics and in some cases, uh, astronomical physics. But I think I do have a cartoon here with alpha particles and beta particles. There we go. Now we're talking. So now, ah, now we're talking. This is the good stuff. All right, perfect. So coming out of the nucleus of an atom, you have an alpha particle, which is a, a particle made of helium. So it's two protons and two neutrons and it's actually a physical atom flying through space called an alpha particle. Then you have uh, beta minus particles, and then you have electrons. And electrons, for those of you who remember your, um, well, your physics or your atoms, electrons are the cloud of things that hang around outside the nucleus of an atom. Then you have neutrons, for example. Yeah, if you have neutron radiation, you can have proton radiation. And then uh, gamma rays, those are the, the big ones, the big scary things that everyone gets worried about, gamma radiation. Incredible Hulk. Incredible Hulk, right? Exactly. Anyone who's seen that would know. So gamma rays are actually photons. They're, they're light particles that are very, very, very energy heavy. And they can travel a long distance because they're light particles. They don't interact with matter as much. Uh, and so they can go a long distance, with, meaning that they can travel kind of through the body pretty easily, depending upon how much energy they have. Whereas alpha particles, since it's a physical particle of an atom, Alpha particles can be stopped by a piece of paper. You know, alpha particles typically won't go through this. If I was to have a meter and be measuring alpha particles and then put this between, it would stop measuring nearly as much of it. Beta radiation or beta particles are just electrons. And so those have, uh, they interact with matter less than alpha particles do. And so they have the ability to say, go through a piece of paper. And I would see betas on the other side of this. Whereas if I was to put a piece of wood or, you know, something pretty light, you know, a little piece of plywood between, they would stop the beta particles pretty effectively. Gamma rays would go right through that wood and keep going. Gamma rays is when you start needing lead shielding, metal shielding, things like that. But even so, because it depends, and as a toxicologist, a fellow toxicologist, you'll appreciate this. Uh, it depends on how you get your radiation. 
whether you're getting it externally, whether you inhale it, ingest it, you know, it, it, how a toxic can affects the body is entirely dependent upon how it's actually introduced to the body. And radiation is actually the same way. So gamma radiation from the outside uh, is typically what you'd look at. You look for what we call deep dose, and we can get into that whole thing at some point if you want to. But whereas if you were to inhale alpha bearing particles or you were to uh, ingest uh, nuclei that give off alpha particles, that's actually more of a risk because it can be directly next to the mucosal cells of your body and then just spitting radiation at them, which has more of a likelihood to cause disease. So you, you really have to look at the toxicology and the radiobiology, which has a lot to do with the same baseline coursework that I took. And I'm assuming with your PhD in toxicology that you took. Actually, my PhD is in farm. So, so oh, it's, I well, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a cylindrical principle is like looking at how cells do what they do and how things can disrupt that process. Yeah. 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 So that was, that was in there. I'm sorry. I was, I was looking at something else just briefly. Um, let's see. So Connor, we have a request here. I mean, I'm happy to play middleman if you don't want to put your information out public, but uh, last Zulu says, so I wanted to talk to Connor. How do I get in contact with him? Yeah. Uh, so uh, if last is he the no CR Frank was the one who was saying he was in radiation protection too. Yeah. So yeah, if last Zulu, um, yeah. Tell you if you got a question you want to you want to ask me, feel free to ask Anwar, and then he can shoot it right over to me. Yeah. Um, last it Zulu depends, it depends on what. If you got a question just on personal level, I'm happy to ask it. But if you have questions about what I do, I would have to vet these things first. So we'll we'll go through Anwar. Yeah. So, last Zulu, if you want to get in contact with me, uh, there are numerous ways you can do that. Uh, there's 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 my Twitter handle. There's my Instagram handle. There's that email address right there, at the second from the, the the top row. So there are numerous ways you can get in contact with me. Um, and then, yeah. So let's see. We're almost at an hour. You're 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 pointing at something. No, I was trying to point over to your info over that way. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So, let's see. Okay, so in summary, in summary, one more time, in summary, the, the, the extra skills you had to attain in, in, right. involved, what, what was specialized about health physics? So, so specialized about health physics was going and looking at radiation physics, which is the, the specific math and equations involved with how radiation occurs and how you stop radiation, how you shield from radiation, going through all those things. Radiobiology was another one uh, that I hadn't had before. And that's like toxicology is the study of how chemicals can cause cells to do things wrong and make disease. Radiobiology is the study of how radiation makes cells do things wrong and causes disease. So that's very, that's simple, very simple principle. Where is that? So that's the biological component because my question was there, was there a, a biological slash medical component. So that sounds like that would be it. Yes, very much so. And all of radiation protection is based around preventing disease in people. So you have to know how radiation causes disease in people to know how to stop it from causing disease in people. The radiochemistry is another one is, is actually doing chemistry, but using different nuclides and different um, chemical procedures to actually generate or isolate or do other things to different amounts of nuclides. Uh, and then I think there was some uh, industrial health and hygiene, actually, which I didn't I hadn't expected. That was something that I took. And that came in really handy for learning how industrial processes work, how safety works on an industrial scale, occupational health and medicine, and, or not occupational medicine, occupational health and safety. And that plays a lot into what I do now, which is basically keeping people safe from radiation. OK. It was daunting at first. The math was daunting at first, but it's just. Yeah, I was going to ask, have you, do you have a better handle on it now than, than when you're, you're was your high school teacher? I hope so. Okay. No, I definitely do. And, and once, you, once you focus in on what you're doing and what you've chosen to do, you can do anything. It's just a matter of, of getting past the fear stage and focusing on what you want and then going and getting it. Okay. I didn't complete my sentence there versus yeah. I, I meant to, I should have said 
versus when you took it with your high school teacher? Yeah. I had very good professors at CSU and I had, you know, I had the support of my friends and family who really wanted me to succeed. And that made a lot of difference compared to trying to take a class from someone who actively didn't want you to succeed. Okay. From, uh, and I only have like, like two more questions from a high level. Uh, can you say a, a few words about what you're doing now? Uh, just, I, I know some of it's confidential and, but some of it deals with definitely subjects we can't talk about given the, the field that I work in is nuclear. There are a lot of things that we deal with. Uh, what I do is uh, for any of you that work in any business at all, you'll be familiar with OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration of the United States. You'll see their placards up on the lunchroom or wherever it is that they post those. You have the right to a healthy work environment. Call this number. You know, everyone has seen those. OSHA deals with keeping people safe and healthy while at work from industrial accidents, slip strips and falls, you know, needless things like that. My job is roughly the same thing, but for people who work in the nuclear industry or who deal with radiation. So I design safety protocols and safety systems. NRC, there you go. Yep, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So that's a, an excellent example of a regulatory body in the nuclear field. So I help design policies, procedures, and safety systems to keep people safe while working with radiation from the maximum amount of radiation that they're allowed to get given a, a certain work environment to the maximum amount of material that we're allowed to work with, to designing what kind of personal protection equipment, what kind of PPE someone has to be wearing while they work with a certain type of, of uh, nuclear material. Basically anything and everything. Every time that there's a project where people come to me and say, we want to do this, we want to do X, Y, and Z. My job is to then look at that from an engineering perspective, look at the radiation safety perspective and say, okay, you need to do P, D, and Q in order to keep yourself safe. Okay. And really, the simple answer is what I do is implement 10 CFR 835, which is the Code of Federal Regulations dealing with radiation safety. Which okay. So you're still, you're still federal. So I'm a contractor. I work for Battelle Energy Alliance, which is a, a federal contracting company, but we are under federal law, uh, and that's... That's what we do. So we, RADCON, which is uh, radiation control, we implement 10 CFR 835. And make sure we follow that to the letter, as well as any and all DOE, Department of Energy, uh, orders that come out. Okay. So just briefly, because uh, Battelle, Battelle has its hands in a bunch of different things. So is it is it is it a technology company? Is it a, um, you, said, well, you said it's a contractor. A contracting company, but it has several different aspects that it focuses on. Right. So that one, um, so BEA, the, the the company that I work for, Patel Energy Alliance, they run, they're contracted to run a lot of different national laboratories. I think saying anything beyond that would probably go beyond the scope of what I asked them. So I would say go to Wikipedia, look up Battelle. And you can get your information about what the company is. And from there, there's a lot of information about what they do. It's it's a science and engineering and contracting company for the government. Okay. Well, that's... that's Lara Wait, who's that? Who just said Alara? C.R. Frank. Yes. C.R. Frank. All right. My boy. So, so you guys going to tell us what Alara, what that acronym means? As low as reasonably achievable. So in the radiation field, when we're working with radiation, we know... There's no such thing as not dealing with radiation. There, you, you can't not get a dose of radiation. And especially since the all of us in our daily lives on plane flights that we do, dental x-rays, chest x-rays, eating bananas, standing next to another human being who has potassium-40 in their body, we are all exposed to radiation all the time, all of us. So the average amount of radiation that a person is exposed to in a year in the United States is about 620 millirem. We can get into scales of how that's measured later, but there's a baseline of radiation that all of us are exposed to, all of you out there are exposed to. That's not harmful to the human body. So ALARA as a principle is the, the overarching goal of what we do in radiation control, which was to keep people's exposure to radiation as low as reasonably achievable. Not none, we can't have none, but we wanna keep it as low as we possibly can and still get the job done. Okay. Give me one second here, Connor. We're just about at the end here. 
Sure. I appreciate you coming and talking, Carter, because I've learned a lot. I, I hope everyone else. Sure. So has... for those of you who weren't clear about this, I, I work at Idaho National Laboratory here in Idaho Falls, Idaho. And out of all the national laboratories, our job is to design nuclear power systems, new reactor types, working with existing reactor types, fuel, high level stuff like that. Okay. Well, my, um, let's see. Yeah. And I, and I wrote an example here. I imagine uh, uh, NASA has individuals with your training as well, since, since astronauts are going up into outer space and there's no atmosphere up there. Um, and that's in, that's in a large part what space suits are designed to do in addition to keeping an oxygenated environment for the astronaut is to protect from the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the radiation from the sun. Absolutely. So I know that NASA definitely employs people with our type of training. Um, spaceships, uh, spacecraft, I should say, have to be both insulated from uh, you know, temperature and an oxygen and an environment standpoint, but they also have to be shielded to keep radiation, cosmic radiation and solar radiation away from the crew. And so on you know, long trips to Mars and things like that, it's going to be very important for engineers, for physicists to be able to design systems to keep people safe for long distance travel in space. In fact, in the 60s and 70s, uh, a big put, well, it wasn't a big push, but it was a big idea was that you would actually make more or less an inflatable spacecraft of which there would be an inner layer, the people tube that people would live in. And the outer layer would actually be inflated with water because water is actually very dense, very heavy. You need water to live and it's very effective at shielding radiation. So you can kind of kill two birds with one stone where you have your water supply with you while also using it to shield you. Okay. Let's see. Connor, do you have any other uh, comments or, or, or factoids or any, any ner nerding out that you want to leave us with? So I, I think what, the coolest factoid that I can come up with is that, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of really cool factoids. God, I wish I could share them with you all. But I will say from my journey where I was in a place and I decided I didn't want to go there, and it was a big risk to try and jump and go to somewhere else. It ended up being super worth it. And I'd say for any of you that are in a place where you don't want to be, find something different. It's never too late. Anwar is going to be a YouTuber. He's going to be a big star. You're going to see his name in lights on marquees everywhere. It's never too late. So for me, well, well, well. I saw a random video online from 1961, from 1962, technically, about a nuclear accident that happened. And I thought that was the coolest thing since sliced bread. And not only did that lead me to actually jump off the rails and go get a degree <laughs> in a completely different field that I had never worked in before, I eventually got a job at the place where it happened. And I now work with the area where it happened. So it's, it, it's weird how that kind of came full circle for me. But it's, it's anything is possible for anybody. So find something, it, it's such a, you know, a trite thing to hear, but it just find something that really piques your interest and do that. Yeah, I would add on to that. Yeah, that, that that's a real thing. You, uh, yeah, we talked about Three Mile Island. Yeah, you, sometimes you train for something or you get into something and then you start wondering, is there something else? Um, that, that a lot of people experience that. Everyone, the video is there in a link, this one that Connor shared with us, the SL1 accident. I will take a look at this uh, once we finish up uh, myself. Um, you could probably put snippets of this on, on your channel, actually, because again, it's, it's free and clear. This was made by the federal government years ago. The other person to check out, there's another YouTuber who's very famous for this. His name is Kyle Hill. And he has a lot of great videos on, on nuclear accidents, on nuclear science, Chernobyl, Fukushima, SL1, uh, the Bergorsky incident, a lot of really cool videos. And he's a great storyteller. Uh, is another great YouTuber to check out. Okay. Connor, before we wind down, uh, the background there is actually this. And I was, I, I understand some of this from my physics training, uh, but perhaps you can, uh, we can nerd out a little bit. You can walk us through this. So this is a radiation detector, right? For, oh yes. Uh, looks like a handheld. That is called a Geiger Muller tube, GM tube. Okay. So I know I, I recognize the ohms and the voltage. 
And so that, that meter is probably reading the current. Yeah, so the, the meter, the, the meter there, I it's hard to see what it's actually suggesting, but basically you know what? So, so we have we have argon. We have argon, and I guess the radiation would ionize that argon. Let me grab and... for you real fast. Let me grab a visual aid if I may. All right, all right, all right, all right. All right, this is a Geiger Muller counter. Okay. Can you hear that sound? That's what we see on all the science fiction movies, yep. Wow. So the way that this works is it has this probe here. This is what's called a pancake probe, about a 44.9. And so there is a gas, let me actually silence that. There we go. So there's a gas in here, and there's an electrical current that's run between a, uh, the anode and the cathode that runs across that gas. And it highly charges the gas. Well, it doesn't charge the gas. It creates a huge electron, uh, electronic potential between two different points. And so when the radiation actually strikes this little film right here and goes into that gas, the energy that's come in from that radiation is enough to ionize that gas because the electron potential is so high that it's really easy for that gas to get ionized. Once it does, it goes through something called a cascade where all of the gas inside of here will all ionize at the same time and that will produce a pulse of electricity. And that gets read by this meter as a count. Each pulse is counted. So it shows how many counts per minute that you have. And from there you can basically measure the amount of radioactivity that you have in terms of counts per minute which you can relate to activity and to the amount and to grams and different things through mathematics. This right here is a, a glaze on a cup. This cup was made in the 1930s. And that glaze that you see this color was actually created by an oxide of uranium. And so this is just, that is the, the term for this is actually fiesta wear. You can still find this in, um, you know, flea markets, swap shops, antique shops all over the place. It was pretty common in America in the 1930s, 40s, through I think the early 60s. But yeah, because of that, you can hear the amount of radiation that's coming off of this. Almost all of that is alpha particles though, which because alpha particles can't really travel through human skin, through the dead layer of human skin, this is not a human health risk just to be on the outside of you. I can't hear you for some reason. That was going to be my next question was, is it safe for you to be holding that in your hand and holding it close to your face like that? Yes, this is safe to hold in my hand. I, I use this to drink from sometimes. If I was to grind this into a fine powder and then try to snort it, then we'd have issues. Okay. Don't do that. Don't, don't snort your pottery and I think you'll be okay. Because actually from this amount of, of uranium, if I was to snort this, I would probably die of silicosis before dying of radiation. Okay. All right, Connor. Well, that's all I've got. Um, do you have anything else? No, I think that's great. It's nice to, to be on here. It's nice to meet some of your audience. See our Frank. I see you out there. I hope what you meant was uh, you're a few tests away from getting your full CHP, which would be awesome, dude. And if that's the case, go for it. And I wish you the very best. Uh, Zulu. My man, if you want to ask me any questions, you can get in touch with Anwar. Snuggles, I didn't see any 99 red balloons. I'm a little disappointed. I am not going to lie. Okay. Yeah, everyone. Well, Connor, yeah. Um, hey, hopefully this is the first of many. Anytime you want to come back. Yeah, I love uh, or I may come and poke you again and say, hey, come back. Sure. And then let, let, let's talk some more. Let's nerd out some more. So hopefully you can come back sometime. Thanks, Anwar. It's great to see you again, my friend. I hope you do well too. All right, take care, Connor. Yeah. All right, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and um, wind this string down. I want to thank the group uh, that was here to watch this. Some of you all are the the regulars, quote unquote. But if this stream, if the algorithm, if the YouTube algorithm has brought you here and you're new, uh, definitely please consider hitting that like button. 
Um, and if you want to make a donation on the back end of this, uh, my cash app and PayPal are here, but they're also below in the description box. There was a lot shared here. Even if you didn't understand all of the physics that Connor talked about, well, that me and Connor talked about, uh, this is a career field. And these are ongoing efforts in our country. And I think that the part that we talked about regarding nuclear and uh, nuclear energy and how and whether or not we'll need that going forward and how much we'll need going forward, I think that's important just for common knowledge because these things are talked about all the time, especially um, in political discussions. This is a, a an election year, but these things are always talked about and I think a lot, a large part of the population doesn't understand nuclear and how that would play into an energy policy going forward. And it, in my opinion, it's about, it's not always about being right. It's about asking the right questions. So, all right. So I'm going to wind this down. Oh, uh, UFO Kamikaze says, great conversation. I'll have to rewatch from the beginning. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, UFO Kamikaze. Thank you for your um your viewership um i i do have a group of regulars over here and this these science topics these don't resonate with everybody i mean that's just the reality of it um yeah if you want if you want to make a donation that information is below in the description box also please consider joining the big words llc newsletter I had to go and create another form in GoDaddy because I had, a, I had a glitch with the form. I had a glitch with that feature in my my payment information, and I, and I think everything got wiped. So the old form, if you're watching several videos back, the old form doesn't work. But this form is underneath this video, and it works. So there's, there's a two-paragraph greeting, and there's a subscription button there at the bottom. And it should take you to this order form there. It takes you to that order form. You enter in an email address and you'll be a part of the list. And I send this out monthly. The link to the newsletter is here. And my email address for the newsletter is below there. So if, if for some reason this stops working and you want to join, you can just shoot me an email and say, hey, I want to join your list. All right. So everyone, I'm going to wind this down. I want to enjoy the Sunday that I have left and it is time to make some dinner and I'm making dinner tonight. So everyone, um, yeah, if you enjoyed this, let me know and also let me know what topics you might want to hear about. I have other guests I want to bring on and I have other content that I want to make as well, assuming YouTube doesn't think it's um, against community guidelines. So everyone, enjoy the rest of your Sunday, uh, and please leave comments below this, especially if, you, if you're watching on the playback. So everyone, please like, share, and subscribe, and as always, remember that your attitude determines your altitude. Take care, and I will talk to you the next time. Bye-bye.